Well, I hope you're sitting comfortably, because I'm here to make you feel uncomfortable. I'm going to start with a story of a young woman, about 17 years old, who'd just come out of a traumatic breakup with her boyfriend, and had decided that she wanted to go out and have a really good time with her friends. So that's what she does. They get ready, they look good, and they go to a club, and they have a few drinks, and they're dancing, and they're having a really good time. As the night goes on, they're joined by a couple of male friends, who they've known for quite a while, not too well, and they continue to drink, they continue to dance, and they're having a really good time. But at some point, she's had a little bit too much to drink, and her friends decide it's time to go home, and they say, "Come on, let's go home." But she doesn't want to, and she insists that she stay behind. So her friends leave, and she stays behind with her male friends, who also wanted her to stay behind because they were having a really good time. By the end of the night, she's completely inebriated. She gets up to leave, and her male friend says to her, "Don't go home. Come to over to my place, and I'll make you a coffee. You can sober up." And so that's exactly what she does. He takes her home to his place. He makes her a coffee, but she's completely wiped out. She falls asleep. During the course of that night, he rapes her twice. I won't get into details. But in the morning, she wakes up to banging on the door. It's her friend who had left her the night before, who had located her and come to pick her up. She was humiliated, shamed, and it took her 25 years to share her experience. Now I know what some of you may be thinking: that she put herself at risk. She drank too much. She made a conscious decision to stay behind, although she could have gone home with her friends. She had also agreed to go back to her male friend's apartment, even though she could have taken a taxi home. So this rape was, in fact, the result of a series of decisions, obviously stupid decisions on her part. Others may be thinking, "Well, did she resist? Did she say no?" Because if she didn't explicitly do so, then obviously her actions and behavior spoke for themselves, and we can't possibly hold him accountable for misinterpreting them. Others may be asking, "Well, did she report to the police? Did she visit the health services? Did she tell a trusted adult?" But regardless of your different, of the diversity in your different understandings and interpretation of the incidents I've just described, it is almost without exception conditioned by a social and cultural reality, by the common beliefs, behaviors, desires, and emotional reactions that society cultivates in us. Well, today I'm going to talk to you precisely. About how our understanding of sexual violence against women is molded, known in feminist circles as rape culture. Now, rape culture is often dismissed as just a phrase that's made up by fanatical feminists that want to make men look bad, or make it look as if rape happens far more often than it actually does. But perhaps we don't truly understand what rape culture is. Besides, if you're hearing the phrase for the first time, it could be really confusing. We understand. Culture or cultural practices, from a sociological or anthropological point of view, as customs and social behavior that a society engages in together, and we find it difficult to link the word rape in that context. We know that at its core, our society doesn't outwardly promote rape, but we don't outwardly promote rape. But rape culture is something more implicit than that. It's about social practices that society do engage in together as a society that excuses or otherwise tolerates sexual violence against women. It's about how we collectively think about rape. The sexual objectification of women in mainstream media is one important factor that plays a role in rape culture. In a culture with widespread sexual objectification, women especially tend to view themselves as objects of desire for others. Sexually objectified women are dehumanized by others and seen as less competent and less worthy of empathy by both women and men. Everywhere we look, we're assailed by images 
of women as sexual objects and vilified if we fail to meet the increasingly extreme beauty standard. And that is not to say that men are not objectified in mainstream media, because they increasingly are. And although such objectification may, is, is always harmful, it's never harmful in the same way. Why? Because women and girls live in a world defined by the threat of sexual violence and rape, whereas men simply do not. And I'm not saying that such images cause sexual violence, but they do contribute to the normalization of dangerous attitudes towards women and men. Towards women and girls, sorry. And yes, it's true that sex is used, and probably will always be used, to sell products and advertising, but they've become more graphic and more pornographic than ever before. Such images normalize battering, sexual assault, and even murder. But it's not only in advertising that rape culture is promoted and perpetuated, it has also infiltrated almost all aspects of popular culture. Think about songs that glorify sexual assault, that are topping the billboard charts. Think Robin Thicke's Blurred Lines. Blurred Lines, indeed. Or movies that feature rape and sexual assault as their main theme. They're Oscar Award winners. Think The Accused, of 12, or more recently, 12 Years a Slave. Rape and abuse is also used as a useful plot twist in some of the most highly rated shows on television. Think Game of Thrones. Pornography that has become more mainstream than ever before. A multi-million dollar industry where sex and violence has become one and the same. And what about language? Now, any linguist will tell you that language shapes the way we view our world. Well, let's take a moment and think about how our everyday language promotes rape culture. Think about how we refer to women when engaging in verbal warfare. Slut, whore, bitch, cunt. Or how using sexually threatening language against one's sister or mother is pretty much the norm. We all use this kind of language every day, men and women. In fact, it's, this kind of language has become so normalized, we don't even realize what we're actually saying. We even tolerate rape jokes as acceptable forms of humor. And when we call people out on it, we're told to lighten up and that we can't take an innocent joke. But we have to stop normalizing this kind of language in our everyday lives. We need to call ourselves and others out when we use it. The only way we can change things is if we hold ourselves and others accountable. Now, Rape culture infiltrates our society with a series of myths. And I don't mean that in the fantastical sense, but in the sense of promoting false beliefs, ideas, and expectations. I'm going to talk about five of those myths, the ones that particularly piss me off. Myth number one, it wasn't legitimate rape. Now we're treading in murky waters. Apparently, some would have us believe that there are degrees of rape. Now, this is an updated version of a once medically supported notion that it was virtually impossible to rape a resisting woman because her pelvic and thigh muscles were considered powerful enough to fend off unwanted penetration. The updated version of this logic is that rape is mostly random okay, and takes place in extreme conditions. According to the legitimate rape logic, Rape is committed by strangers unknown to the victim, and it takes place in conditions without substance abuse, with the threat of force or use of force, and with evidence of physical or verbal resistance on the part of the victim. Well, I hate to break it to you. It's not as simple as that. It is estimated that over 90% of sexual assaults are committed by someone known to the victim. That's their brother, their friend, their ex-boyfriend, their neighbor, their teacher. They're not other. They're you. They're me. Rape myth number two. It's not rape if she didn't say no. Now, the absence of objection doesn't in itself constitute consent. Lack of consent may result from either the use of force or threat of force, 
or incapacity to consent on the part of the victim, such as when asleep or intoxicated. The responsibility is on the party who's advancing the sexual acts to get that consent. And when I say consent, I mean affirmative consent. That's affirmative, conscious, voluntary agreement to engage in sexual activity every step of the way. If they do not get that consent, then they are guilty of sexual assault and or rape. Myth number three, it was her fault. I challenge you to read any news article or report on an alleged incident of rape that doesn't reek of victim blaming. Language, stories, images that support or trivialize rape are so pervasive we have become numb to them. At best, we've become completely desensitized to the victim. At worst, we actively hang them out to dry. There is no other crime in which so much effort is expended to make the victim appear responsible. <sighs> When you know you won't be believed, you're far less likely to share your experience, even with loved ones. When you'll be shamed and questioned, you're far less likely to speak openly about your experience of sexual violence. And when you know you'll be treated as if you're the one who's at fault, you're far less likely to report to the police. Your culture, my culture, made her feel responsible. Myth number four, she was drunk. Now, this is obviously related to victim blaming, but I wanted to address it separately. I'm not condoning high-risk behavior. I'm not promoting high-risk behavior. But let's be clear, no amount of alcohol can make one person become a rape victim in the absence of another doing the raping. Rape is not a chemical reaction. Being drunk or otherwise incapacitated is a situation in which full, informed and free consent cannot truly be given. Despite this, it is shocking how much effort and money is put into telling girls and women to prevent their own rape instead of addressing the root causes of sexual violence and shaking the foundations of rape culture. Here are some examples of such well-meaning but totally misplaced campaigns. So the message is that women willingly and stupidly put themselves in the path of danger. You can prevent your rape by not being that woman at that bar being drunk, not staying out until that time, and not accepting that lift. But isn't the message also that that rapist will probably rape someone else? But maybe that's okay, because it wasn't you, and it wasn't me. Rather than asking why she became a victim of rape, we could ask what makes one person rape another. But we don't ask those questions. Which brings me to myth number five. Rapists are not monsters. Studies have indicated that as few as 5% of men are psychotic at the time of their crimes. Few convicted rapists are referred for psychiatric treatment. I understand that people want clear categories for the type of person that would do something so horrible, and that that category to be clearly different and separate from mainstream society, from you, from me, from us. But the ideas that rapists are monsters and other is actually silencing the victim, because that monster might be someone she loved. So if we're ever going to prevent rape, we need to go beyond the rape is wrong and done by bad people, because that makes us feel more comfortable, it makes us feel safer. We need to start having an honest conversation about how violence has become sex, and sex has become violence. Now, I I know that this requires cultural change, but I think it's eminently doable. Culture, after all, is not something that's static, it's not fixed, it's fluid, it can change over time and space. And there have been some really encouraging signs. All over the world, anti-rape campaigns and organizations are naming and shaming rape culture and debunking the myths that sustain it. Men are increasingly recognizing their role in addressing sexual violence and doing some incredible work to raise awareness and encourage communities to take action. 
In the United States, colleges are rethinking how they legally define consent on their campuses. No means no is out. Yes means yes is in. The White House has just launched the major campaign called It's On Us to prevent sexual assault on campuses across the U.S. It is possible to change the culture that sustains a situation that has such a devastating impact on our society, on women, on men, on girls and boys. Everyone who's here gets the message, talks to a few people. Every one of those people talks to a few people. Everyone here in this room can be the circuit breaker. And the first step is to go back to that story about a young woman raped on a drunken night out and look deeper. <laughs>